In this segment, we're going to look at one application of something called a contingency table. Here we have a contingency table where we have frequencies in the table corresponding to two different variables, our mode of instruction for a class and a grade distribution. Now our hypothesis test, calling a test for independence, is where in the null hypothesis of the test, we're testing to see we have the mode of the instruction and the grade distribution are independent. So it's a test of independence. Um, if in our hypothesis test we reject that null, then our alternate will be the mode of instruction and grade distribution are dependent. So whenever we're doing a hypothesis test for a test of independence, your null hypothesis will be that the two variables that you're working with within the contingency tables are independent and your alternate hypothesis will be that those two variables are dependent. So this is another case where our null and alternate hypothesis are not where we have a parameter with relationship to a number or another parameter, but we have it in terms of a phrasing of a test that we're doing within the problem. Now for these, we again want to look at the difference between our observed and our expected values. And we want to make sure that we have where we've taken a random sampling within each of the entries of our contingency table, um, that those numbers that we have are from a random sample, and the expected for each thing is at least five. Now, just like with our hypothesis test with the goodness of fit, we're going to look at our observed values, our expected values, and then we're going to calculate the observed minus expected quantity squared divided by expected within a table format. And then our test statistic will be the total of this final column. Now the observed ones are really easy to get. We just need to look at what the observation was of the values within our contingency table. So for our observation of those students that were in the randomly selected from the fast track and the grade of A to C, there were 26. <clears throat> then for the traditional with a grade of A to C, we have 30. For the fast track with a grade of D is 6. For a traditional with a grade of D, we have 12. And then with the fast track, grade of F or W is 18. And then traditional grade of F or W is 8. So those are exactly what we said they are. They're of the observed values that we have from our sampling. To get the expected for each thing, the expected for the fast track and the grade of A through C what we do to calculate that is that we take the row total for that entry, 56, times the column total of that entry, 50, and then divide it by the grand total from the contingency table. So this first expected, if you take 56 times 50 and divide it by 100, you will get 28. And you might want to take time to just go ahead with that calculation and make sure that you're going to get your that you get your 28. Next, for the expected value that we would have for our 30, so that's this entry. We have our row total of 56 times our column total of 50 and divide by 100. And if you take 56 times 50 and divide by 100, again, you'll get 28. Now we look at where the entry of 6 is. And to get its expected value, we take the row total from where it's at, 18, times the column total, 50, and then divide that by 100, and you see you will get 9. For our um, observed value of 12, calculating the expected value that goes in that entry, 
it's the row total 18 times the column total 50 and divide by 100 and you will get 9. And then for our second to last one here, our 18 observation, the expected value we would have there, row total 26 times column total 50 divide by 100 and you will get 13. And then finally the last one, our row total of 26 times our column total of 50 divide by 100 and again you will get 13. So that, that's how you calculate the expected for our test of independence case. Now, each of these we want to take the observed minus expected. After we get that subtraction, we're going to square it and then divide by expected. So 26 minus 28 is negative 2. Negative 2 quantity squared is 4. And then 4 divided by our 28 is going to give us a 0 0.142. Nine. 30 minus 28 is 2, 2 squared is 4, and then 4 divided by 28 again is our 0 0.1429. Next one, 6 minus 9 is negative 3, negative 3 quantity squared is 9, and then 9 divided by 9 gives me 1. And then 12 minus 9 is 3, 3 squared is 9, 9 divided by 9 is 1 again. And then 18 minus 13 is 5, 5 squared is 25, and 25 divided by 13 gives me 1.9231. And then 8 minus 13 is negative 5. Negative 5 quantity squared is 25. 25 divided by 13 is 1.9231. Now to get our test statistic for this problem, our chi-squared, you get by adding up all of these numbers. So when we take and we add up all of our numbers, our value is 6.132. That's our test statistic. Now again, if we compare our test statistic with our critical value, you think of this bottom line being a number line, and place numerically 6.132 where it belongs on the number line with relationship to your critical value 5.991 that we've gotten from the chi-squared table. So when I place 6.132, it falls further to the right and that value is underneath the shaded area, which is the rejection region. And so here we're going to reject our null, H0, using a 5% level of significance. So we have the data is significant to support the claim that the mode of instruction And the grade distribution are, remember with the alternate, is that they are dependent. Now ju let's just recall for a minute how I got this critical value for this test. It's a chi-squared distribution, so we went to the chi-squared table. Chi-square table has degrees of freedom, and in the test of independence case, the degrees of freedom you calculate by taking your number of rows in your contingency table, minus one, times your number of columns in your contingency table, minus one, for the entries. So I had 
my number of rows, I had A through C, and then D, and then F and W. So that's three rows. And then I had fast track or traditional, so I had two columns. So I have 3 minus 1, which is 2, times 2 minus 1, which is 1. So my degrees of freedom, we had 3 minus 1 times 2 minus 1, which gives me 2 times 1, or a degrees of freedom, which is 2. So we go to the um, chi-squared distribution table, look at where we have our 0.05 level of significance, degrees of freedom being 2, and that's where you will see the 5.991. Now there's a lot of uh, calculators that will actually do this test of independence for you. And what you need to do is put the observed values within a matrix. So you just put it in like in matrix A with the number of rows and columns and put your, just your um, entries of your observation values in there. And then when you do the test of independence, the chi-square test of independence, um, it will report the information for the test statistic and it will give you your p-value. And remember, with all of our hypothesis tests, if our p-value is smaller than the alpha, that's when you get to reject the null, when the p-value is smaller than your level of significance. If your p-value is bigger than your level of significance, then you cannot reject the null. So whichever way you use in order to do your hypothesis test, whether you do your traditional method with your um, working with the test statistic and the critical values and placing them along the number line, or whether you compare your area to the extreme of your test statistic, your p-value, with your level of significance, your alpha, you will still have the same decision of these hypothesis tests, whichever way you go with making that choice. It's just make sure that you keep straight what you're doing your comparison on, to make the correct decision at the final step of the hypothesis test.